Wagging the Moondoggy, Part 1, by David McGowan, written on October 1st, 2009. I'm going to be redoing, as I've told you, my series on Wagging the Moondoggy, which is a 14-part uh, series or articles uh, from David McGowan, who is no longer with us. He passed away in 2015 but who has written some of the most compelling and humorous and well-written articles surrounding our supposed trip to the moon. Please stick by and um, look for each one of these episodes. I'm not sure if I'm going to let them out once a week or maybe one every two or two every week, but it's going to be a fun series. I'm just going to read his writings and I will add some illustrations on at times and maybe one or two editorial points that pop into my mind. But essentially, I'm just going to be reading exactly what David wrote. If you guys don't know who David McGowan is, I challenge you to go look up Wagging the Moon Doggy. It'll take you to his page and he has a lot of writings, extremely talented writer, and he's it's a lot of fun. So without further ado, we're gonna jump right in and I'm gonna start reading uh, these uh, essays, essentially, that uh, he wrote. And I think you guys are going to really enjoy them. So buckle up. It's going to be a fun ride to the moon and back. Not really. Hey, guys, one quick preface before I jump into this series and I jump into reading this is I'm not going to edit every little mistake. I'll correct it as I go because I don't want these each one of these episodes to take me a week to do. So... Uh, bear with me if I flub a word or two. We all know I do that. And if I have to reread a sentence or whatnot. So with that little disclaimer out of the way, let's, uh, let's jump into this thing. It's commonly believed that man will fly directly from the earth to the moon. But to do this, we would require a vehicle of such gigantic proportions that it would prove an economic impossibility. It would have to develop sufficient speed to penetrate the atmosphere and overcome Earth's gravity. And having traveled all the way to the moon, it must still have enough fuel to land safely and make the return trip to Earth. Furthermore, in order to give the expedition a margin of safety, we would not use one ship alone, but a minimum of three. Each rocket ship would be taller than the New York Empire State Building, almost a quarter of a mile high and weigh about 10 times the tonnage of the Queen Mary, or some 800,000 tons. Werner von Braun, the, uh, the father of the Apollo space program, writing in Conquest of the Moon. If you don't know who Werner, Werner von Braun is, look him, look him up. He was an extraordinarily smart Nazi scientist, but that's a whole different story. Jumping in. I can see all of you scratching your heads out there, and I know exactly what it is you're thinking. Why in the hell are we taking this detour to the moon? What happened to Laurel Canyon? Have you completely lost your mind? Well, that does not mean, however, that I have abandoned the Laurel Canyon series. I intend to go back to it quite soon. And truth be told, while the Apollo story may initially appear to be a radical departure from the ongoing Laurel Canyon series, it actually isn't much of a detour at all. After all, we're still going uh, to be living in the 1960s and 70s, and to a significant degree, we're probably still going to be hanging out in Laurel Canyon, because who else, after all, was NASA going to trust to handle the post-production work on all the Apollo footage, if not Lookout Mountain Laboratory? My next series, side note, will be on Laurel Canyon. I will be covering David McGowan's series on it, but I will be reading it. Moving on. I'm very well aware, by the way, that there are many, many people out there, even many of the people who have seen through all the tall tales told by our government, who think the moon hoax theorists are complete cooks, or kooks, and a whole lot of coordinated effort has gone into casting them as such. That makes wading into the moon hoax debate a potentially dangerous affair. Remember when Luther, played by Don Knotts, gets taken to court and sued for slander and the ghost in Mr. Chicken? And don't try to pretend like you've never seen it because we both know that you have. So anyways, he goes to court and a character witness is called and the guy de de delivers credible testimony favoring Luther. And it is clear that the courtroom is impressed 
and everything is looking good for our nebbish hero, Luther. Remember what happens next, though. On cross-examination, the witness reveals that he is the president of a UFO club that holds their meetings on Mars. This is also exactly what he's going to touch on, what happens to us now. Take the pandemic to any other official narrative story we've been given by our government and by mainstream media and by celebrities and politicians. And when you try to push back on it with critical thinking, how are you labeled? What do they say to you? How, uh, you know, they point and they laugh and they make fun of you for being a conspiracy theorist. Meanwhile, shutting off all critical thought or, um, you know, truth to what it is that you may be saying, any credibility to what it is that you may be saying. Moving on. The courtroom, of course, erupts with laughter, and all of that formerly credible testimony immediately flies right out the window. I have already received emails warning that I will suffer a similar fate from people who heard me discussing the topic on Mary Heller's radio show. Not to worry, though. I have somewhat of an advantage over others who have attempted to travel this path. I don't really care, nor do I. My mission is to ferret out the truth wherever it may lie. If at various points along the way, some folks are offended and others question my sanity, that's not really something that I lose a lot of sleep over. I am a kindred spirit to him in this. Anyways, a whole lot of people are extremely extremely reluctant to give up their belief in the success of the Apollo missions. A lot of people, in fact, pretty much shut down at the mere mention of the moon landings being faked, refusing to even consider the possibility. Facebook, by the way, is definitely not the best place to promote the notion that the landings were fake, in case anyone was wondering. I don't even think you could do it on Facebook anymore. But it's funny that even back then, it was a deal. And yet, there are some among the true believers who will allow that though they firmly believed that we did indeed land on the moon. They would have understood if it had been a hoax. Given the climate of the times, with Cold War tensions simmering and anxious Americans looking for some sign that their country was still dominant and not technologically inferior to the Soviets, it could be excused if NASA had duped the world. And that's kind of what I, you know, I give them credit for. It was a hell of a dupe, and I understand why you did it. But it doesn't mean we actually landed on the moon. Such sentiments made me realize that the moon landing lie is somewhat unique among the big lies told to the American people in that it was, in the grand scheme of things, a relatively benign lie and one that could be easily spun. Admitting that the landings were faked would not have nearly the same impact as, say, admitting to mass murdering 3,000 Americans and destroying billions of dollars worth of real estate and then using the crime as a pretext to wage two illegal wars and strip away civil, legal, and privacy rights. <laughs> I don't love them. And yet, despite the fact that it was a relatively benign lie, there is a tremendous reluctance among the American people to let go of the notion that we sent men to the moon. There are a couple of reasons for that. One of them being that there is a romanticized notion that those were great years. Years when one was proud to be an American. And in this day and age, people need that kind of romanticized nostalgia to cling to. And think about in 2009 how we needed it, opposed to what, how we could use some of that now. But that is not the main reason the people cling so tenaciously, often even angrily, to what is essentially the adult version of Santa Claus, the Easter Bunny, and the Tooth Fairy. What primarily motivates them is fear. But it is not the lie itself that scares people. It is what the lie says about the world around us and how it really functions. For if NASA was able to pull off such an outrageous hoax before the entire world, and then keep that lie in place for four decades. What does that say about the control of information we receive? What does that say about the media and the scientific community and the educational community and all of the other institutions we depend on to tell us the truth? What does that say about the very nature of the world we live in? 
One of the reasons why I'm going back to this series right now is I think it is such a poignant, this has such a poignant message, especially the way he lays it out for the times that we're in right now where all oh, there is so much disinformation and psyops and lies being fed to us. And so many Americans still believe it. But the Band-Aid's getting pulled off, I believe. And I want this series to be used at something to say, let's go back to the 60s and let's look what they were doing to us now and how they pulled off such a egregious, I mean, in your face, humongous lie and the ability of them to lie to us then so we can understand what's happening to us now. That is what scares the hell out of people and prevents them from even considering the possibility that they could have been so thoroughly duped. It's not being lied to about the moon landing that people have a problem with. It is the realization that comes with that revelation. If they could lie about that, they could lie about anything. It has been my experience that the vast majority of people who truly believe in the moon landings know virtually nothing about the alleged missions. And when confronted with some of the more implausible aspects of those alleged missions, the most frequently are, um, offered argument is one that every conspiracy theorist has heard at least a thousand times. That can't possibly be true because there is no way that a lie that big could have been covered up all this time. Too many people would have known about it, yada, yada, yada. But what if your own eyes and your innate, though suppressed, ability to think critically and independently tell you that what all the institutions of the state insist is true is actually a lie. What do you do then? Do you trust your own cognitive abilities? Or do you blindly follow authority and pretend as though everything can be explained away? If your worldview will not allow you to believe what you can see with your own eyes, then the problem, it would appear, is with your worldview. So do you change that worldview? Or do you live in denial? The moon landing lie is unique among the big lies in another way as well. It is a lie that seemingly cannot be maintained indefinitely. Washington need never come clean on, say, the Kennedy assassinations. After all, they've been lying about the Lincoln assassinations for nearly a century and a half now and getting away with it. But the moon landing hoax, I would think, has to have some kind of expiration date. And we just passed the 50th year of it, by the way. How many decades can pass, after all, without anyone coming even close to reenactment before people start to catch on? F uh, five obviously hasn't been enough. But how about six or seven? Um, how about when we hit the 100-year anniversary? If the first transatlantic flight had been followed up with another one, for, or if the first transatlantic flight had not been followed up with another one for another 50 years, would anyone have found that unusual? If during the early days of the automo automobile, when folks were happily cruising in their Model Ts at a top speed of 40 miles an hour, someone had suddenly developed a car that could be driven safely at 500 miles an hour, and then after a few years, that car disappeared, and for many decades thereafter, despite tremendous advances in automob uh, autom automotive technology, no one ever again came close to rebuilding a car that could perform like that. Would that seem odd at all? There are indications that this lie indeed does have a shelf life. According to a July 17, 2009 post on CNN.com, it's been 37 years since the last Apollo moon mission, and tens of millions of young Americans have no memories of watching the moon landings live. A 2005 to 2006 poll by Mary Lynn Ditter, Ditmar, a space consultant based in Houston, Texas, found that more than a quarter of Americans 18 to 25 expressed some doubt that humans set foot on the moon. The goal of my descent, um, the goal of any descent, uh, descent writer is to crack open the doors of perception enough to let a little light in so that hopefully the seeds of a political reawakening will be planted. There are many doors that can be pried open to achieve that goal. But this one seems particularly vulnerable. Join me then as we take a little trip to the moon, or at least pretend to. If NASA had really wanted to fake a moon landing, we're talking purely hypothetical here, 
The timing was certainly right. The advent of television having reached worldwide critical mass only years prior to the moon landing would prove instrumental to the fraud's cause. Wired Magazine. Adolf Hitler knew a little bit about the fine art of lying. In Mein Kampf, he wrote that if you're going to tell a lie, make sure it's a really freaking big one. Truth be told, I'm not exactly conversant in the German language, so that may not be an exact translation. But it certainly captures the gist of what the future Führer was trying to say. He went on to explain that this was so, uh, this was so because everyone in their everyday lives tells little lies. And so they fully expect others to do so as well. But most people do not expect anyone to tell a real whopper. You know, the kind of brazen outlandish lie that is just too absurd to actually be a lie. That kind of lie. That is so over the top that no one would dare utter it if it was in fact a lie. That is the type of lie, according to Hitler, that will fool the great masses of people. Even when the lie is so transparently thin that it couldn't possibly stand up to any kind of critical analysis by anyone actually exercising their brain, rather than just blindly accepting the legitimacy of the information they are fed. Take, for example, the rather fanciful notion that the United States landed men on the moon in the late 1960s and early 1970s. That's the kind of lie we're talking about here. The kind that seems to defy logic and reason and yet has become ingrained in the national psyche to such an extent that it passes for historical fact. And anyone who would dare question that historical fact, needless to say, must surely be stark raving mad. If we can't also see some parallels just in that last thing right now of what we're seeing, where up is called down and down is called up, this Orwellian 1984 insane world we're living in, where we can see with our own eyes we're completely being gaslit and lied to, and we're told by all the authorities and the, and the, and the powers that be, that what, what we're being told is the truth, and we know it's a lie. We were doing this back then. It's our MO. It's what our government has done to us for many, many, many decades. Moving on. Before proceeding any further, I should probably mention here that until relatively recently, if I had heard anyone putting forth the obviously drug-addled notion that the moon landing were faked, I would have been among the first to offer said person a ride down to the grip store. While conducting research into various other topics, however, it has become increasingly apparent that there are almost always a few morsels of truth in any conspiracy theory, no matter how outlandish that theory may initially appear to be. And so despite my initial skeptic skepticism, I was compelled to take a closer look at the Apollo program. This is the same story for me back in 2008, 2009, when he was writing this. That's kind of when my lights were going off on this. The first thing that I discovered was that the Soviet Union, right up until the time that we were allegedly landed the first Apollo spacecraft on the moon, was solidly kicking our ass in the space race. It wasn't even close. The world wouldn't see another mismatch of this magnitude until decades later when Kelly Clarkson and Justin Guarni came along. The Soviets launched the first orbit, orbiting satellite, sent the first animal into space, sent the first man into space, performed the first spacewalk, sent the first three-man crew into space, was the first nation to have two spacecraft in orbit simultaneously, performed the first unmanned docking maneuver in space, and landed the first unmanned probe on the moon. Now that's one other thing when people say, well, what about the, what about the reflectors or the lasers up there? Well, w there's arguments to say those aren't up there, but there's also the other side of that argument to say, Who's to say we didn't send an unmanned probe up, probe up there? I'm, I'm not questioning that completely. I don't think we really have. I mean, up until maybe recently, right, when a couple of the countries and us have done that. But back then, back then I also don't believe we did it. Maybe somewhere in between. But that's still a bit of a far, a little bit out there for me. Everything the U.S. did prior to actually sending a manned spacecraft to the moon, and which hasn't been done, 
uh, in the last 50 years by anyone, had already been done by the Soviets, who clearly were staying at least a step or two ahead of our top-notch team of imported Nazi scientists. Operation Paperclip. The smart money was clearly on the Soviets to make it to the moon first, if anyone was to do so. Their astronauts had logged five times as many hours in space as, our, as had ours. Five times. And they had a considerable amount of time, money, scientific talent, and perhaps most of all, national pride riding on that goal. And yet amazingly enough, despite the incredibly long odds, the underdog Americans made it first. And not only did we make it first, but after a full 50 years now, the Soviets apparently still haven't quite figured out how we did it. The question that is clearly begged here is a simple one. Why is it that the nation that was leading the world in the field of space travel not only didn't make it to the moon back in the 60s, but still to this day have never made it there? Could it be that they were really just poor losers? Am I imagining that perhaps a conversation over a Moscow's equivalent of NASA went something like this? <clears throat> Comrade Ivan, there is terrible news today. The Yankees imperialists have beaten us to the moon. Which are we do ski? Uh, let's just shit can our whole entire space program. But comrade, we are so close to success, and we have uh, so much invested in their effort, Ski. Fuck it. If we can't be first, we aren't going at all. But I beg of you, comrade, the moon has much to teach us, and Americans will surely not share us the knowledge they have gained, Ski. Yet. That's my Russian accent. It's pretty awesome, I know. In truth, the entire space program has largely been, from its inception, little, little more than an elaborate cover for the research and development and deployment of space-based weaponry and surveillance systems. The media never talked about such things, of course, but government documents make it clear that the goals being pursued through space, search, space research are largely military in nature. For this reason alone, it is inconceivable that the Soviets would not have followed the Americans onto the moon for the sake of their own national defense. It is not just the Soviets, of course, who have never made it to the moon. The Chinese haven't made it either, nor has any other industrialized nation, despite the rather obvious fact that every such nation on the planet now possesses technology that is light years beyond what was available to NASA scientists in the 1960s. Some readers will recall, and younger readers may, might want to cover their ears here because the information to follow is quite shocking. In the 1960s, a full complement of home electronics consisted of a fuzzy 13-channel black and white television with a rotary turning dial, rabbit ears, and no remote. Such cutting-edge technology as the pocket calculator was still five years away from hitting the consumer market. It is perfectly obvious, of course, that it is not consumer electronics that allegedly sent the man to the moon. The point here, though, is that the advances in aerospace technology mirror advances in consumer technology. And just as there has been revolutionary change in entertainment and communications technology, so too has aerospace technology advanced by light years in the last four decades. Technologically speaking, the NASA scientists working on the Apollo project were working in the dark ages. So if they could pull it off back then, just about anyone should be able to do it right now. And I understand what some people are going to say, that secret, top secret technology is 10 or 20 years ahead of what we have in the consumer market. Regardless of that, the argument still stands. It would be particularly easy, needless to say, for Americans to do it again. Since we've already done all of the research and development and the testing, we'll get, we'll get to that later, why then, I wonder, have we not returned to the moon since the last Apollo flight? Following the alleged landings, there was considerable talk of establishing a space station on the moon and of possibly even colonizing Earth's, uh, Earth's satellites. Yet all such talk was quickly dropped and soon forgotten, and for nearly five decades now, not a single human has been to the moon. Again, the question that immediately comes to mind is why? Why has no nation ever duplicated or even attempted to duplicate this miraculous feat that we did six times? Six or seven, I forget now. 
Why has no other nation even sent a manned spacecraft to orbit the moon? Why has no other nation attempted to send a manned spacecraft anywhere beyond low Earth orbit? Is it because we already learned everything that there was to learn on the moon? I hear a lot of people say that. That, well, we cost a lot of money and there's, we went there several times and we're good. We know all we need to know. If so, then it could, uh, could it reasonably argue that it would be possible to make six random landings on the surface of the Earth and come away with a complete and thorough understanding of this heavenly body? Are we to believe that the international scientific community has no open questions that could be answered by <clears throat> return trip to the moon? And is there no military advantages to be gained by sending men to the moon? Has man's keen interest in exploring celestial bodies, evident throughout recorded history, suddenly gone into remission? Maybe, you say, it's just too damned expensive. But the 1960s were not a particularly prosperous time in the U.S. history, and we were engaged in an expensive Cold War throughout the decade, as well as an even more expensive hot war in Southeast Asia, and yet we still managed to finance no less than seven manned missions to the moon, using a new disposable multi-section spacecraft each time. And yet in the four, or excuse me, five decades since then, we are apparently supposed to believe that no other nation has been able to afford to do it even one time? While we're on the subject of passage of time, exactly how much time do you suppose will have to pass before people in significant numbers begin to question the moon landing? NASA has recently announced that we will not be returning as previously advertised by the year 2020. <laughs> Didn't hit that one. There's too much going on in 2020 to go back to the moon anyways, although the moon might have been a safe place to be. That means that we will pass the 50-year anniversary, already have, of the first alleged landing without a sequel. Will that be enough elapsed time for people will begin to wonder? Um, for pe time that people will begin to wonder? What about after a full century has passed? Will our history books still talk about the moon landings? And if so, what will people make of such stories? When they watch old preserved film from the 1960s, how will they reconcile the laughably primitive technology of, the, of that era with the notion that NASA sent men to the moon? Consider this peculiar fact. In order to reach the surface of the moon from the surface of the Earth, the Apollo astronauts would have had to travel a minimum of 234,000 miles. Since the last Apollo flight allegedly returned from the moon in 1972, the furthest that any astronaut from any country, country has traveled from the surface of the Earth is about 400 miles. We say we sent them there seven times, 234,000 miles away from the Earth. And since that time, the farthest anybody's gotten is 400. Think about that. Let that sink in. And a very few have gone even, uh, and very few have even gone that far. The primary components of the current U.S. space program, the space shuttles, the space station, the Hubble telescope, operate at an or uh, orbiting altitude of about 200 miles. NASA gives the distance from the center of the Earth to the center of the moon as 239,000 miles. Since the Earth has a radius of about 4,000 miles and the Earth's radius is roughly 1,000 miles, that leaves a surface-to-surface -surface distance of 234,000 miles. The total distance traveled during the alleged missions, including Earth and Moon orbits, ranged from 622,268 miles for Apollo 13 to 1,484,934 miles for Apollo 17 on a single tank of gas. To briefly recap then, in the 21st century, utilizing the most cutting-edge modern technology, the best manned spaceships the U.S. can build will only reach an altitude of 200 miles. But in 1960s, we built a half a dozen of them that flew almost 1,200 times further into space and then flew back again. And they were able to do that despite the fact that the Saturn V rockets that powered the Apollo flights weighed in at a poultry 3,000 tons, about 0.004% of the size that the principal designer of the very same ro Saturn rockets had previously said would be required to actually get to the moon and back. 
primarily due to the unfathomable, unfathomably large load of fuel that would be required. Uh, Werner von Braun. Werner von Braun. The Nazi scientist said that. Think about that. We said we went there and back on 0.004% of the amount of fuel that the head Apollo scientist said you would need to get there. To put this into more earthly terms, U.S. astronauts today travel no further into space than the distance between San Fernando Valley and Fresno. The Apollo astronauts, on the other hand, traveled a distance equivalent to circumventing the planet around the equator nine and a half times. And they did it with roughly the same amount of fuel that it takes to uh, make that 200-mile journey, which is why I want NASA to build my first or my next car for me. I figure I'll only have to fill it up the tank up once and it should last the rest of my life. But wait, you say, NASA has solid evidence of validity of moon landings. They have, for example, all of the film footage shot on the moon and beamed live directly into our television sets. Since we're on that subject, I have to mention that transmitting live footage back from the moon was another rather innovative use of 1960s technology. More than two decades later, we would have trouble broadcasting live footage from the deserts of the Middle East. But in 1969, we could beam that shit back from the moon with nary a technical glitch. As it turns out, however, NASA doesn't actually have all the moonwalking footage anymore. Truth be told, they don't have any of it. According to the agency, all the tapes were lost back in the late 70s. All 700 cartons of them. As Reuters reported on August 15, 2006, the U.S. government has misplaced the original recordings of the first moon landing, including astronaut Neil Armstrong's famous one, stall, one Small Step for Man, One Giant Leap for Mankind. Armstrong's favorite moonwalk, famous moonwalk, moonwalk, seen by millions of viewers on July 20, 1969, is among transmissions that NASA has failed to turn up in the year in years of searching. Spokesman Gary Hadalana said, We haven't seen them for quite a while. We've been looking for over a year, and they haven't turned up, Hadalana said. In all, some 700 boxes of transmissions from the Apollo lunar mission are missing. Given that these tapes allegedly documented an unprecedented and unduplicated historical event, one that is said to be the greatest technological achievement of the 20th century, how in the world would it be possible to um, lose 700 cartons of them? Would not an irreplaceable national treasure such as that be very carefully inventoried and locked away in a secure film vault? And would not copies have been made and would not those copies also be securely tucked away somewhere? Come to think of it, would not multiple copies have been made for study by scientific and academic communities? Had NASA claimed that a few tapes, or even a few cartons of tapes, had been misplaced, then maybe we could give them the benefit of the doubt. Perhaps some careless NASA employee, for example, absentmindedly taped a Super Bowl game over one of them, or maybe some homemade porn. But does it really seem at all credible to claim that the entire collection of tapes has gone missing, all 700 cartons of them, the entire film record of the alleged moon landings, and what alternative reality would that happen accidentally? Some of you are probably thinking that everyone has already seen the footage anyways, when it was allegedly broadcast live back in the late 1960s and early 70s, or on NASA's website, or on YouTube, or on numerous television documentaries. But you would be mistaken. The truth is that the original footage has never been aired. Let me repeat that. The truth is that the original footage has never been aired. Anytime or anywhere. And now, since the tapes seem to have conveniently gone missing, it, it is quite obvious they never will be. The fact that the tapes are missing, and according to NASA, have been for over three decades, amazingly enough, was not even the most compelling information that the Reuters article had to offer. Also to be found was an explanation of how the alleged moonwalk tapes that we all know and love were, uh, were created. 
because NASA's equipment was not compatible with TV technology of the day. The original transmissions had to be displayed on a monitor and then reshot by a TV camera for broadcast. I'm going to repeat that also. Also to be found was an explanation of how the alleged moonwalk tapes that we all know and love were created. Because NASA's equipment was not compatible with TV technology of the day, the original transmission had to be displayed on a monitor and reshot by a camera for broadcast. So what we saw then, and what we have seen in all the footage ever released by NASA since then, were not, in fact, live transmissions. To the contrary, it was footage shot off, of, uh, shot off of a television monitor, and a tiny black and white monitor at that. That monitor may have been running live footage, I suppose, but it seems far more likely that it was running taped footage. NASA, of course, has never explained why. Even if it were true that the original broadcast had to be reshot, they never subs uh, subsequently released any of the actual live footage, and as we know now, it's gone. But I guess that's a mute point now, what with the tapes having gone missing and all. With NASA's admission of how the original broadcasts were created, it is certainly not hard to imagine how fake moon landing footage could have been produced. As I have already noted, the 1960s were a decidedly low-tech era, and NASA appears to have taken a very low-tech approach. As moon landing skeptics have duly noted, if the broadcast tapes are played back at roughly twice their normal running speed, the astronauts appear to move around about in ways entirely consistent with the way ordinary humans move about right here on planet Earth. Here then is a formula for creating a moonwalk footage. Take original footage of guys in ridiculous costumes moving around awkwardly right here on our home planet, broadcast it over a tiny low-resolution television monitor at about half the speed, and then refilm it with a camera focused on that screen. The end result will be a broadcast-ready tapes that in addition to having that all-important grainy, ghosty, rather surreal broadcast from the moon look, also appear to show the astronauts moving about in entirely unnatural ways. Pause recording. One of the things I kind of wonder about, too, is with all this new remastered footage that they have out, who's to say that that isn't the actual faked footage that supposedly had disappeared that they're passing off as just remanufactured or, or remastered, digitally remastered old footage? I don't know. That's just my thought. I got no proof to that. But they lied to us about this whole thing, in my opinion, so they could easily lie to us about that. Moving on. But not. But not, it should be noted, too unnatural. Let me go back here on that sentence. I apologize. The end result would be a broadcast-ready tape. In addition to having that all-important, grainy, ghosty, rather surreal broadcast from the moon look, also appears to show the astronauts moving about in an entirely unnatural way. But not, it should be noted, too unnatural. And doesn't that seem a little odd as well? If we're being honest here, and for my testosterone-producing readers, this one is directed at you. And testosterone could be also for any of you, you know, uh, testosterone enhanced listeners. This is for you also. The average male specimen, whether astronaut or plumber, never really grows up and stops being a little boy. And what guy, given the once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to spend some time in a reduced-gravity environment, isn't going to want to see how high he can jump or how far he can jump? But hitting a golf ball? Who the hell wants to see that? How about tossing a football 200 yards for a touchdown pass? Or how about the boys dazzling the viewing audience with some odd-worldly acrobatics? And yes, Neil and the guys did exhibit some playfulness at times while allegedly walking on the moon. But doesn't it seem a bit odd that they failed to do anything that couldn't be faked simply by changing the tape speed? When I attended college, I knew a guy on the volleyball team who had a 32-inch vertical leap right here on Earth. So when I see some guy jumping maybe 12 inches, if that, in a one-sixth gravity environment with no air resistance, I'm not really all that impressed. Am I the only one, by the way, who finds it odd that people would move in slow motion on the moon? Think about this. Why would a reduced gravitational pull cause everything to move much more slowly? 
given the fact that they were much lighter on their feet and not subject to air and wind resistance, shouldn't the astronauts have been able to move quicker on the moon than here on Earth? Was slow motion the only thing NASA could come up with to give that fo video footage an odd otherworldly feel? Needless to say, if what has been proposed here is indeed how the moon landing footage in the public domain was created, then the highly incriminating original footage, which would have looked like any other footage shot here on Earth, except for the silly costumes and props, would have had to have been destroyed. Perhaps it's not surprising then that NASA now takes the position that the original footage has been missing since sometime in the late 1970s. Unfortunately, it isn't just the video footage that is missing. Also allegedly beamed back from the moon was voice data, biomedical monitoring data, and telemetry data to monitor the location and mechanical functionings of the spaceship. All of that data, the entire alleged re uh, record of the moon landings, was on the 13,000 reels that are said to be missing. Also missing, according to NASA and its various subcontractors, are the original plans, blue, blueprints for the lunar modules, and for the lunar rovers, and for the entire multi-section Saturn V rockets. <laughs> Think about that for a minute again. It's not all the telemetry data, it's the biomedical data, it's the voice data, the blueprints for the lunar module, and for the rover, and for the entire Saturn V rocket are missing. There is therefore no way for the modern scientific community to determine whether all of that fancy 1960s technology was even close to being functional or whether it was all for show. Nor is there any way to review the physical record, so to speak, of the alleged flights. We cannot, for example, check the fuel consumption throughout the flights to determine what kind of magic trick NASA used to get the boys there and back in less than 1% of the required fuel. And we will never, it would appear, see the original first generation video footage. You would think that someone at NASA would have thought to preserve such things. No wonder uh, we haven't given them money to go back to the moon. They'd probably just lose it. Thus concludes the first part of Wagging the Moon Doggy. Please tune in next week for part number two or maybe in a couple days I'll let you know again as you listen to these series I know this is something that happened back in the 60s 70s and what does it matter now it sets a precedent it tells a story it reveals a a lie it reveals a um, psychological operation that was played upon not only us but the whole world by our government the power of our media the power of our the hollywood um element the power of our politicians the power of propaganda and apply that to what is going on now and i hope what that applying does when you think about that i hope it does i hope i just I can red pill or a black pill or whatever color pill it is, one person through this series to where you can think about it and you can realize, dang it, not to lose hope in everything around us, but to refocus on what really matters. And it isn't the narratives and the lies we're being fed from our government. Until next time, it's SJG Perspective. We'll talk to you soon. Bye. You're looking great. How you doing, Control? We look good here, fine. All right, how about you, Telcom? Go. Guidance, you happy? Go. Fido. Go. 2,000 feet, 2,000 feet, into the ag, 47 degrees. Roger. 47 degrees.